Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. Today I'm going to talk about the essay, the essay that won me the PhD entrance exam back in 2015. I'm going to do a deep analysis of that essay, and but in the same time, I'm going to try something new. Why, for, for instance, we try to feed the same question to an AI and try to see if we are going to get a really satisfying answer? By this, we can try to compare which essay is better, and also we try to see if we really can in a live, for example, at least in the preparation phase on an, an any AI. So this is something we try. So let's try to do it. Let's have a look at the essay first and try to see the question here in front of us. So the question is, according to academic research, linguists have demonstrated that there is not one single best teaching method for everyone in all contexts comment. This question was back in 2015. Actually, I'm really not quite sure about the question, but I know this is the question and this is my essay and it's in the original, it's an original form. I haven't changed anything. So of course, don't criticize me harshly if you see kind of any, like a big problem there. So let's head to ChatGPT, for example, and try to feed the question to it. And let's say what kind of answer we are going to get and if it's really satisfactory or not. So. We start with this statement as not best single teaching method for everyone in context. It's well supported by academic research. Okay, this perspective aligns with the understanding that language learning are complex, but good. Dynamic processes influenced by myriad of factors. What are these factors? Known as backgrounds, cognitive styles, cultural context, specific linguistic goals. So we have learner diversity as the first point. Contextual variability, that's nice. Context with teaching curves plays a crucial role. Factors, that's good nice available resources so we have materials sociolinguistic environment that's all magical good evolution of pedagogical theories also eclectic adaptive approaches i think that would be the answer itself so in summary let's read the summary the acknowledgement that no single teaching method is universally superior reflect the complexity of language education effective teaching requires nuanced nonsense understanding of the learners the context etc etc but can you take this and put it directly? For me, if you are going to modify it a bit and you put it like a really good essay, I think it's going to work because the introduction is good. Although it's a bit kind of just repeating the question, but the thesis statement is clearly here. It's clearly here. This is something really good. So let's move to my essay and try to see what I did. And if I have talked about the same kind of concept, like I have here. So I go to number, um, sorry. Okay. Um, so I go to it. Okay. Okay. So let's move to the essay. I started like in the cliche. So the history of a second language teaching is marked by numerous approaches and methods. But I added more, explaining more. Often these methods come as a result of general assumption about language and language teaching. So I didn't try to say that language and language teaching is complex, but I just wanted to state the fact that this is what we have and we have like so many methods. But what's the difference? Now, the focus on specific skills, this is I added because I wouldn't wanted to talk about skills. So these approaches, what's the problem with them? Prescribe a checklist for the teacher to follow in the classroom. And this is true because if you are going to revise the methods and approaches, each method is going to dictate what the teacher what the teacher has to do. So the teacher is going to choose how to teach according to the method and approach is going to or she is going to adapt. So, however, this is the problem here. Given the complexity of the learning teaching context and the involvement of many variables, this is the same thing I did like in AI, but back in 2015, we didn't have that. Such as learner's attitude, I wanted to talk about learner's attitude, I want to talk about teacher's proficiency, I want to talk about objective and aims, and I wanted to talk about material availability. Making any attempt to teach from the perspective of one method or an approach would be inconceivable. So it will be difficult. And this is, I always something say to my students, try, try your best never to repeat the same words in the question. So I, instead of saying it's difficult to be, I said it is inconceivable. And here I provided the solution as a solution to this issue. This is, uh, I don't like it as a solution to this. I think this is kind of not a really good style, especially for me now. 
Ed educationists advocate the use of an eclectic approach to language teaching. So this is what I'm proposing. As I can see, as I always say, the introduction itself comprises the whole answer. The whole answer is here. The thesis statement. This statement is clearly visible here. It's this one. This is the thesis statement. And it has everything in it. This is what I'm going to develop. So I'm going to develop learner's attitude. I'm going to develop teacher proficiency. I'm going to develop objective and aims. And I'm going to develop materials availability. Now, and maybe I'm going to ponder and I'm going to ponder on the idea of eclecticism. Let's go to the very first paragraph. And here I did, I did something kind of different. As you can see, I started the first administrative constraint. I still did not go directly to a learner attitude. In fact, I kind of stepped backward and talked about the whole thing of methods and approaches and the teaching itself. So I said, the first administrative constraint a teacher faces when making any decision about teaching is the objective in the syllabus. And this is actually, this is... I would try, if I am going now to write an essay, I would try to put something, a hint, to this, intro, to this paragraph in my introduction. So I would for sure do this. So the first administrative constraint teacher faces when making any decision about teaching is the objective in the syllabus. According to Willis 1990, and this is where it's really good to add citation, this is here we have citation, the primary reason behind the use of an eclectic approach is the conflict that arises between a syllabus and methodology. And here means that methods of teaching, maybe I would change this word if I'm going to write an essay now. He adds that a syllabus and methodology can either complement or hinder each other. How so? Indeed, if the aim of the syllabus is to teach the structure of the language, how a teacher can achieve that through a communicative approach? Thus, instead of holding rigidly to the communicative approach, a teacher can fall back to more traditional approaches to serve that particular aim in the syllabus. You see, when I wrote this, in fact, I was really reflecting on my practices as a middle school teacher. As a middle school teacher, I had this problem sometimes. They tell me, no, you have to use the communicative approaches all the time. But sometimes I, I want to, to teach, for instance, for example, something in the structure of the language. Say, for example, I just want to teach the present simple like this. If I'm going to use communicative approach, it's going really to make it really long process. I would find it so easy to do it directly. And this, in fact, if you read this, it really happens in many cases, and it needs to be addressed, this issue. This is how I talked about it. And I move now to the second. Moreover, even if the methodology is an objective and everything is good, out of line, the teacher can face difficulties in mixed ability class, and this is where I start to talking about learner's attitude. So what happened? Our aligned, the teacher can face difficulties in mixed uh, mixed ability class. Every learner has his or her, his or her own attitude towards a foreign language, and each one has a unique ways of learning. Thus, a teacher has to be flexible to accommodate all this diversity. And by the way, I do remember when I was writing this, I have added few examples. It is also example here. Consequently, a single method may serve some learners while rendering others unlearned. For example, many teachers in rural areas in Adrar, because I passed the PhD in Adrar, I don't know if I, I wrote it in Adrar or I removed the word, but I was in Adrar, so I don't know, I think it's safe to write it there. It says that learners face problems with speaking skills and understanding grammatical rules implicitly. While they excel when they are taught grammar explicitly, which unfortunately goes many against many supervisors. Here I meant about supervisors, I meant the inspectors. So this is my talk concerning concerning learners' attitude. Next, and this paragraph I think really really made a difference. This paragraph because it's something uh, it's rarely we talk about. It's about the teacher. Additionally, similar to learners, teachers also have their strengths and weaknesses. A teacher may do well with certain approaches and methods and fail to bring satisfactory results to others. Therefore, confining a teacher to a specific paradigm may have positive or probably negative outcomes. This is, it can be changed because the style is not that good. 
The eclectic approach can provide teacher with freedom and flexibility in teaching and learning context. I think if, if someone is going to read this, for me, it's not a really good style because I told you. I wrote this in 2015. I'm not really happy with this. But what I really meant by this, that even teachers, we have strengths and weaknesses in the way we teach. Some teachers, for example, they can do well with certain ways of teaching and they can do well in others. Now, let's move to, in terms of materials, now I move to the idea of materials. Some methods are closely related to the use of specific materials. The issue is that a government cannot ensure the availability of materials across all schools. A good example can be seen in Algeria. While authorities insist on the use of materials, many schools, especially those in rural areas, do not have access to required resources, which makes, which makes any method that relies on them useless. And this is true. So many times they said use communicative approaches, use video projectors, or use these kind of two pictures, relaria, rel oh, forgot the word. And But the problem, you don't find like any, maybe even electricity sometimes. So how can you do that? On the other hand, sometimes the circumstances oblige the teacher to adapt a contingency plan which involves the use of a different approach. For example, in a power failure, which tends to occur also in remote regions. So this is something. So let's go to the to the conclusion. However, the adaptation of an eclectic approach in the classroom requires profound knowledge from, from the part of the teacher. It is often assumed that only teachers with good training can incorporate several approaches in their teaching. On the other hand, those who are given recipes of how to teach with no theoretical thinking about the advantages and drawbacks would tend to be slaves of the textbook. Here I do remember that I do really remember that one of in one of the lessons that the teacher told us that even when you talk about an eclectic approach you have to be very careful because not all teachers can do that so this is why i added that sentence kind of itself it's a conclusion but in itself it's a kind of a counter argument saying that only good teachers can use this kind of approach so this is how i did it and i hope you you reach this this the end of the video and I hope you have benefited from this. See you inshallah in other videos. Goodbye.